Hello and welcome to uh, NHSR podcast number three on 20th of October 2021. Uh, I'm Chris Beely. I've got into the habit now. It's only po- episode three. I've now realised I need to introduce myself. So I'm Chris Beely. I'm the co-chair of NHSR and I'm also a data scientist in Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust. And today I have with me uh, Andrea Sotiriades. Andrea, do you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Sotiriades. I'm a data scientist. Currently, I'm working at the Ministry of Justice, but I'm here because I spent an awesome year at the NHS, uh, Nottinghamshire NHS. Oh my God, that, that's this name is uh, is pretty. It's a um, it's a pretty hard name to say, isn't it? Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. Solid. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I spent a year there under the management of Chris. Uh, I did the uh, text classification and text mining of patient experience data. Thanks very much. Yes. Yeah, so today we'll be talking about a project. It's a bit different the format uh, this time because we actually both worked on this project. So I'm going to be sort of hosting and just giving a bit of chit chat as well about what I did. Um, so as Andrea said, so it was all done uh, within our team in Nottingham Healthcare. Andrea has sadly now moved on to practice new at the MOJ. Um, so the problem we were trying to solve basically was um, NHS provider trusts are mandated by NHS England to collect what's called friends and family test data, which probably most of you have seen, even if you don't know what what it's called. So when you go and see the doctor or if you go to the hospital, you'll get a little form with ticky boxes that says whether you had a good experience or not. And uh, that ticky box data is very easy to analyze. However, the text data that usually comes with it is not easy to analyze. And my own trust, Nottingham Healthcare, actually does read and tag all of its feedback, but not all trusts do. And I've been in contact with lots of trusts and they make a sincere effort to read as much as they can. Um, but in actual fact, they, they can't. And so what that means is that although individuals within the organization might read uh, bits and bobs of feedback from their area, there isn't a, a sort of an overall approach um, sort of aggregating and filtering and sifting it all. Um, because there isn't time basically to to get someone to to read it all. So I wanted, we wanted to produce uh, an algorithm essentially that would read people's uh, patient experience data for them, and it would tell them two things. The first thing it would tell them it was telling what it was about. So people would might talk about communication, they might talk about um, staffing levels or um, the environment, parking, that kind of thing, uh, and also how positive or negative it was. We never came up with a good word for this. Um, but basically the idea that sometimes people will say, oh, this service is amazing, you're so fantastic. And other times people will say, oh, this terrible service is terrible, you're all rude and lazy and I hated it. And so we wanted some sort of way of, of uh, distinguishing between those two. So that's what the project was all about. Um, and NHS England came to me, um, I think, I don't know, about two years ago, I guess now, uh, and very kindly agreed to fund a year of the of this project and we the intention was that we would develop it within our own trust with our own data and we would also work with some partner organizations who would also provide data and we would use their data in order to make sure that the, the model we produced was generalizable and worked with other uh, trust data and we would also having done all that work producing the models we would then produce some sort of uh, reporting system some sort of dashboard which those of you who know me know that i'm so that's my sort of thing in life for some reason is dashboards um we would make some sort of reporting system that allows the trust to very easily go in and see what people are saying where they're saying it when they're saying it and all that kind of stuff um and that's what the project was all about so let's now just turn to andreas who can just talk about the the algorithm and that that side of things for us cool okay so i'll start the uh, i'll start with the text classification because um the whole the, the project was text mining in general which also involves uh, sentiment analysis and uh, uh, you know um, analysis of uh, frequencies you know most frequently occurring words or bigrams etc but uh, I think it's important to start with the text classification part. It was the very first thing I started in this project. And uh, being an R user for the last 10 years, I, my immediate uh, you know, reaction when uh, Chris said, oh, let's, let's classify those. Uh, let's, let's build a, a model that trains on the data, the, the label data we already have, uh, and on the text we already have, and, and predict what uh, incoming text is about, my immediate reaction was, okay, let's use R. And I was very excited with the package MLR3 then because uh, 
back then I had used it for another project in a previous role and I really wanted to use it for, for this project. Uh, so I, I started doing stuff in MLR3, but uh, at the same time in parallel, I was also checking out uh, tidy, models, we, tidy Models, which is also a pretty uh, popular uh, machine learning package in R. Uh, soon to realize that uh, I probably had to, to switch to something faster. You know, I, I think most our users know that uh, R is awesome in, in many aspects. I mean, I, I think R is way, 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 uh, uh, you know, ahead in terms of, of many things, especially R Studio, the, uh, the IDE, uh, and also the, the uh, packages that uh, are available uh, in, in so many different areas. But it, it tends to be really, really slow. It's a designer thing. I don't know the computer science aspects of it, but it, it hasn't been designed to be fast, let's say. So it, it can really uh, fail when you have a, uh, well, not fail, but it can really slow things down uh, significantly to uh, hinder the progress of a project, uh, especially when it comes to processing large amounts of data. And um, I'll just, those... can I just throw in something yeah. there, just Andreas? Um, just for those of you who are interested in such things, yeah, I mean, what Andreas is talking about, really, you can see it very clearly when we run the algorithm on the server. Uh, the Python code that Andreas is going to go on to talk to, it runs, it, it's multi-core out the box. There's no configuration. There's no messing around with it. It just, it will, it will, it will use all the cores on the server. Um, whereas R, of course, famously doesn't do that. It just uses one core. And therefore, you know, you're looking at like a six or eight time uh, increase in the, in the amount of time it takes to process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and also, uh, to give you an example, uh, for those who, are, who haven't done text, cl text classification before, a, a standard way of doing it is that you take the whole text, uh, everything, you know, all the patient feedback responses, you split the whole thing into tokens, and each token, so each word, let's say in this case, uh, becomes a predictor or a feature. So you have this massive matrix that has a, can be filled by frequencies. So for example, the word, I don't know, cat or whatever, you know, it's, um, it, can, uh, it becomes a predictor and there are zeros where it doesn't occur. And then there is a, some sort of frequency uh, in the, you know, in the part of the text, in the record where it does occur or something, something like that, let's say, the, you know, high level. So you have, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of, of predictors. Uh, and th th think this can uh, slow things down quite a lot in R. To give you an example, when I um, first uh, used R Studio Connect to run MLR3 with a random forest, it, it took something like 12 hours be before the process was just killed, you know, by the server itself. While to fit in Python, uh, five or six or seven different models, uh, classifiers, uh, it, it took something like three hours on, on, on the server. So there is a massive difference. So soon I realized that I had to switch to something faster and I had never used Python before. I knew that Python is pretty strong with machine learning. I had, you know, heard about it, never really had had some experience. And uh, I had heard about uh, Scikit-Learn, which is like the most uh, classic example of, a, you know, a, of a machine le learning package that has all the, uh, um, you know, has a, a range of models from the simple log logistic regression ones to, to, to more complicated models. Um, so I, I read about it. They said it was fast, it was scalable. Um, so I thought, okay, let's give it a go. And there was also quite a lot of examples. I mean, there is a very, there's a very good uh, user documentation about uh, Scikit-Learn uh, on the package website. So it was really helpful for, for me because I would just copy an example about text classification that was available already where the guys had fit a pipeline that uh, benchmarked different models, fitted and benchmarked different models. So I took it and I uh, tailored to my needs and I started running stuff soon to realize that it was, it would run so much faster and it, were, it, it was so much more um, rich in terms of uh, text classification tasks than, uh, than the, the, the R packages. Don't get me wrong, I still love the R packages. I think both MLR3 and tidy models are great, but I think you need to pick the right tool for, uh, for what you want to do. And in this case, R 
uh, wasn't the right tool. It was Python and and, and Scikit-learn. Uh, to to Chris's disappointment, who who hates Python. <laughs> well, I will just I will throw in there. There is, we we do have a lot of back and forth about Python. Um, I can write a bit of Python, but I'm 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 bad at it. I think the thing to say, basically, from my point of view, is that I think Python is highly specialized for text. I think really, if you're doing machine learning with text, I don't think partly because of what we talked about with the you know with the CPU and all that kind of thing, but also partly just because of the 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 the, the, the libraries and the packages that are available. Um, they tend to come out earlier, faster, and better in Python. Um, so I actually, funnily enough, went on the exact same journey as Andreas before he started on the project. As I started with R, I mean, I didn't do anything near the quality of work that he did, but I was just messing around. And I also rap had to rapidly ditch R. So I think um, for those of you who are interested in, 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 in particular, doing text mining with, uh, sorry, doing machine learning with text, which is a pretty difficult task from a computing point of view, I think we would that would definitely be our recommendation. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, uh, I think I think that's all I had to say about uh, Python and machine learning, Chris. Anything else that you'd like me to add? But uh, yeah, I mean, it was a it was a very interesting journey, and it paid off. It definitely paid off. Uh, it, it took some time to to learn Python. Well, learn Python. Actually, I I, I I tend to say that I don't know Python. I know Scikit-Learn because that's that's what I use. I mean, it's a very uh, you know, it's a it's a very specialized package, and I, I I know very well how to use it. Plus a few manipulations here and there with pandas and all these you know all all these standard packages that uh, that you would need to use uh, when you build a, a a machine learning pipeline or some sort of data science analysis uh, thing. Uh, Actually, something that I would like to mention is that uh, the whole pipeline, the scikit-learn pipeline, also evolved to into a package called PXTEX Mining. So we're actually using a package now for uh, for fitting the the, the classifiers uh, in in the new you know in, in the text that we have. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's on the um, it's on our uh, CDU data science repo. Yeah, so I'm going yeah. to pour this in the show notes. That's the other thing that's been bad about this podcast up, so up till now is the show notes. Um, I might go back and edit some of the old ones actually because I feel bad. So I'm going to put links. So this is what this is one of the things that we've done in this project is as a, Andreas says the, the patient uh, the, the the sorry the text mining pipeline. So I'll put a link to that in the in the show notes. Okay, right. So that's that. Uh, as I say, that's a, that's um, that was a deliverable of the project. That's me pretending to be a proper manager. Um, so what else did we do? So we also made a a reporting tool, and that was a responsibility that fell to me, um, partly because of my uh, expertise in Shiny, but also it's not it, it's not also just Shiny. You tend to get into the world of uh, Linux and servers and all that kind of thing, and that's the other thing. I don't quite know how my career ended up here, really, from a psychology PhD, but for some reason, I've become the server guy. Um, so. I like to think this bit of the project is, is reasonably ambitious. I mean, it, it's a fairly simple dashboard. Uh, I, I picked this, I was actually talked about this at a, um, a Data Connect conference a couple of weeks ago. And I was talking about how, what a simple task it is in terms of the um, the data being collected being very similar in different sites. So um, when you're building open source tools, as a lot of you will know, it's quite hard if the input data is very different from site to site. So this project was good in the sense that all provider trusts are collecting this data. It's not the same everywhere because some of the text questions are different and also there's sometimes different numbers of them. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty the, pretty, the, pretty similar. So what that meant was in practice that I could build a dashboard in, in one trust and, and use it in another trust, which has long been my dream. So I would like to just call out some of the methods that I've used that just to sort of promote them. Um, the key thing really that we've used in this project is, is something called Golem. Now Golem is a um, a package basically that allows you to build shiny applications. I'm not gonna go on to a big long, I've talked elsewhere about it. And if anyone's interested in it, then please just hunt me down on the internet and talk to me about it. It does lots of amazing things. It makes a better shiny coder basically. Uh, one, of the, one of the many things that I love about it is it offers you lots of little nice functions that will out of the box uh, give you some indication as to um, 
what version of the of it you're running so they have different options for production and development versions and they also have an ability to uh it's very just simply defined in a yaml file to uh to say uh you know set up parameters for the for the um for the application basically so that's what i've done basically is I, i've i've built the same applications i think i've got i've i've built seven versions of it now but they all work on the same code base it's that it's all just switched out on the fly uh by the uh, by the YAML file, which is pretty simple to write. Um, okay, can I can I say something about the about the YAML file because I think it's a it's an example that will help a lot of people understand how, why Golem is so powerful. So it's it's a it's a very simple example. You you're working with the Iris dataset or with the Penguins dataset in R, and you want to make summary statistics for uh, for each species in each you know in each dataset. So you build your dashboard, you have your dashboard there waiting, uh, but instead of passing the data directly in the dashboard, which is uh, what makes a lot of shiny applications tailor-made and uh, you know specific to the data sets, and you cannot really you know make them generalizable for that reason. Instead of passing them directly, in, you know, in 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 the in, in the code for the dashboard, you pass them in the YAML file, uh, where you specify what your um, numeric variable is what your uh, categorical variable is and what your uh, data set is so in this case you can pass uh, iris or or penguins and the you know and, and the variables i just mentioned so then your dashboard will produce summary statistics for the variables you for, for each species for for the variables you passed for each data set so that's what chris means that he has seven versions of it already so he has a golem framework with the YAML file, and he passes into this YAML file uh, data sets from, say, different NHS trusts. So, so then each NHS trust will have their own dashboard uh, to, 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 uh, to make decisions from. Yes, so it's a very powerful approach. Making reusable stuff is hard, and I think we probably will come to. In fact, I've got a guest that I won't uh, trail just yet, but I think I've got someone come, coming on next year actually who's going to talk about certainly open in the NHS um, and yeah making reusable stuff is really hard and this is a really simple example of where you can make it work fairly easily and I'd like to really build on this and make something because um, the amount of configuration involved is very small it's only probably about 20 lines of YAML so I think with a bit more time and a bit more thought I think probably actually we could build something that's pretty extensible um, and that would be really thinking of maybe across different, different clinical systems or, you know, that kind of thing. I think it's a, it's an approach that we could certainly, um, that we could certainly take. Um, so that's the reporting dashboard part of the project, uh, discussed, as I say, that's another, as I say, in the business deliverable of the project, I will also link to that in the show notes. I think it could probably be repurposed if you didn't want to use um, our text mining inside it. I think you could probably um, repurpose it. I don't know why you wouldn't want to use the text mining inside it because it's all free and there's no reason why you wouldn't. Um, but do have a look at the code and you might not want to do this. You might want to do something else. Hopefully it will inspire you. Um, and that is something that I always just to give a quick plug for open source here. Something that I often tell people is people often say to me that they, they don't want to share their code because well, there's two main things. The first one is because it's not perfect. Um, I mean, who is writing perfect code? I'm definitely not writing perfect code. So don't worry about that. Just publish anything. It's fine. Um, and the second thing that people say to me about why they don't want to publish their code is because it won't run. Because we don't have the data or we don't have the this or we don't have the other. I never, ever, ever run code on open source repositories, ever. I, I can't think of a time when I ever have, to be honest. Maybe a Docker image I might run. But you know deploying someone's environment is actually pretty hard work i can't be bothered i don't care the reason why i want people to open source their code is so i can read it and copy chunks out of it so please don't be put off by either of those things just just publish maybe it doesn't even work on your computer you know but maybe it will give someone an idea and i feel reasonably confident that if you look through some of the stuff that we've been talking about today uh, according to your interest and specialism, you will find at least something that inspires you. And if you don't, then you're clearly way ahead of us, in which case, please drop me a line and tell me what we should be doing, because I really want to hear it. Right. With all that said, let's go back to Andreas. The other big interesting thing I think about this project is the use of reticulate and R. We've already talked about R a little bit earlier um, and the way that Andreas has actually, um, you know, linked the two together. So, Andreas, please tell, tell us about that. Yeah. So yes, um, 
Oh, I was talking about uh, you know using the like the best tool to do the job before, which uh, led me to using Python and Scikit Learning instead of R, um, and the and the machine learning package available there. So uh, in, in in the same spirit, I mean I wanted to to make the best of of both worlds. In this case, being R and Python. So uh, it, it, on the R side of things. Uh, Shiny and Golem, the, uh, the things that Chris talked about before, are extremely, extremely powerful. Shiny is great and Golem is even greater. Um, so uh, I wanted to, to build a dashboard in, in R. Uh, also, well, Chris is an expert in dashboard, so you know, it was the, the best opportunity. It, it was uh, to, to get some support uh, for building my own dashboard, which I had a little experience with b before starting this role. Um, so that's uh, so. Then the, the, one of the challenges were okay. Well, the the whole thing is built in Python, the machine learning part of it. So how do we bring the how do we bring it in R to uh, to present the results there? So that's where Reticulate comes into play. So Reticulate is a is an R package that allows you to run Python through R. Is a, is a, like a Python interface or for no is it an R interface to python yeah i think that's the the, the, the correct order of things uh, so um you can use your uh, uh, you can use your r uh, your, your r code to tell uh, to tell it to run some python stuff in the background pull it into r and do stuff there so for example you want to make predictions on uh, uh, on uh, unlabeled text, you have your fitted pipeline in Python, the one you, uh, I fitted with scikit-learn. Uh, you call it in R, uh, you pass the data, it runs Python in the background, makes the prediction, and puts them, puts them in the dashboard. So reticulate is extre extremely powerful because it, it gives you this, uh, it, it gives you limitless opportunities for uh, you know, for for uh, using using R in ways that wouldn't have been possible before. So you don't need to to anymore to look at Python and R as two separate entities. It can actually be a single entity, and the whole thing is done through R Studio. So it was extremely, extremely, extremely powerful. Also, because of Reticulate, uh, I also had the opportunity to. Uh, experiment with a few other packages in Python, especially for uh, sentiment analysis. Uh, so my sentiment analysis part on the dashboard was partly tidy text, which is you know uh, one of the most best known uh, packages for sentiment analysis in R. Uh, but it was also partly uh, Vader sentiment and text blob, which are uh, Python packages. And what these Python packages do is that they provide you with uh, the calculate aggregate indicators of, of, of sentiment and some other indicators, uh, you know, relevant indicators uh, that you can report on a dashboard uh, you know, as a type of uh, aggregate score about what the feeling is, what the sentiment is, is in a text. Um, so uh, yes, it, it opened it opened uh, up opportunities for us that I don't think we would have uh, even even imagined before that, uh, before articulate. Um, also, I need to mention at this point, I said before that our machine learning package is called PXTX mine, TPXTX mining. We also have a wrapper, an R wrapper called PXTX miner, which is uh, powered by reticulate. So. It uses, it converts all the, the Python functions for uh, splitting the data, uh, building the pipeline, fitting the, the pipeline, uh, assessing model performance, making predictions, all this stuff. Uh, uh, it contains R, uh, R wrappers uh, through Reticulate again that take those uh, Python functions and make them available to make them available to our user to our users. And actually, uh, by the way, this was um, development of Pixex Miner was uh, funded by NHS R. The whole project was funded by NHS England, but this particular package was funded by NHS R. Yes, and um, so we've that's another release, as to say, that will be in the uh, in the show notes. Uh, we could do with some people testing, actually. 
Um, so I'm just going to drop this question on Andreas because it's just popped into my head. And it's probably a stupid question, but this just goes to show that it's okay to ask stupid questions. You could use it to categorize any text, couldn't you? There's absolutely no reason why it would have to be patient experience text. As long as it was reasonably, I think, shortish text with one category, uh, because you can do all the training and stuff, there's no need. So if you're listening to this and you do something else, you can certainly still use the pipeline. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you have text and, and uh, labels, uh, you can use the pipeline. Uh, uh, I, I think it, it's important to mention at this point that uh, although the pipeline does a uh, hyperparameter tuning, um, I have chosen specific ranges of parameters to be tuned. So it's not like you can go to the to to the function that fits the pipeline and, and tell it, oh yes, I I have a I want this alpha parameter for my naive ba base models to be tried uh, within this range of values, for example. No, this is done internally uh, because I, I was actually I debated a lot with with myself whether to uh, allow complete freedom to users to you know to tune any hyperparameter. Uh, they want at any ranges they would like to input, but then having discussed with other machine learning experts in, in, in the field, uh, the general uh, the, the, the general opinion was that uh, you know you may be um, ending up uh, hitting your head you know against the wall because uh, you're trying to accommodate all possible options only to to find out that your model improves accuracy by, I don't know, 1%. So what's the point? So, you know, I did some literature review. I saw what what the uh, hyperparameter values, you know, what ranges other people use. I put these in the pipeline. So there is some tuning happening there, but it's not, it, it's, it's a little bit restrictive, but at least it's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's not, super restricted like one value that's you know that's how the model is going to be fitted there is a range of values it's just that the, the user uh, cannot change them does that make sense yes so do have a go it's as i always say it's so easy that even i can do it so uh, and i have done it more than once so um and that would be really helpful actually because uh i think once people have started using it hopefully you'll start filing issues so i was using the nhsr uh, plot the dots package last week um, and it's beautiful I was blown away by how brilliant it was straight away and it, they're definitely coming on the podcast so if you're listening to this any of the plot the dots team uh, you will one of you will become on here whether you like it or not um, but I did immediately start filing a couple of little tiny issues uh, and that's the lifeblood of open source really is people using your stuff and saying oh have you thought of this have you thought of that so that would be really good uh, so do do check it out um, Okay, so that's I think that's the project ready. Right? It was a one year project. And, you know, we we've, we've done it all it all works. Um, and we're still, we're still delivering all this stuff, all the reporting into various trusts, we're still looking for more trust. So if you work in a provider trust, and you're interested, then just let me know, we're always looking for more people, it's not difficult to get you set up. Um, we plan to do more so we're not just going to drop the project obviously but we actually want to build on it as well i'm not going to go on to a long complicated ramble about all the things that we've got planned but basically my vision is that it'll be something that can be at the moment the, the big limitation of the of what we've delivered is it just does what it says on the tin so it tags to the tags that we came up with um and you know the dashboard is it, it, set up in a particular way as well so i think what i'd really like to do is have a, a machine learning model that can um learn different tags different setups um but very rapidly as well there's there's all these new technologies uh now uh zero shot learning um and active learning all these sorts of things that can drastically reduce the amount of training data you need to fit a pipeline so that's basically what i'd like to to go on to do uh, and again, hopefully, whatever we come up there will be reasonably, as I was saying, with the with the R package being, you know, that you can repurpose it. Um, hopefully, those same approaches could, should be repurposed um, somewhere else. Um, right. Okay. Well, thanks very much. So that's all we want to talk to you about. I'm going to drop another question on Andreas actually now, which I forgot to to, um, to mention, and he might just go white with horror, in which case we'll pick it up in the edit. So let's see. Um, so I've been asking Andreas. Um, well, I haven't, but I want to start asking, 
who where should we go next who would you like either what projects would you like to hear about or what subjects would you like to hear about or what people would you like to hear on the podcast okay that that's that's a very good question i think the the, the stuff you, you mentioned about zero shot and, and all this you know more uh, let's say hardcore uh, machine learning stuff if we had somebody who could communicate this in a very simple language so that it helps other practitioners understand what the whole thing is about, how it works, and actually how you can scale it as well, because that's one of the of the challenges of those models that uh, you know they 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 can work out of the box, uh, you know, pretty well or reasonably well. I mean, if you if out of the box without any training you get a 56 percent accuracy, that's actually pretty impressive. But when you try to run it on thousands of rows of data, that's when you realize that. Uh, where without computing power, you can this this there's little you can do. So I I think it'd be very nice to have somebody talk about uh, about these models. It's like the the let's say okay, this is not. <laughs> I mean, don't take my words for granted, but it's let's say the alternative to the traditional approach of uh, to text classification, which would be you know a logistic regression or a naive based model. Uh, using uh, uh, tokens as features and all the stuff that I mentioned before. So it'd be nice to to have somebody talk about this in more depth, uh, but you know, in a way that the, that is easily communicated to people who have no 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 previous experience with it, because it's it's a field that uh, where the language can be pretty exclusive. So I think it's a uh, it's time we made this um, you know made this field of 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 uh, machine learning a little more approachable to to the wider analytical and data science audience. Yes, that's a good idea. Well, someone springs to mind actually, but they're quite shy. So uh, I will, I, uh, yeah, I, I might have a chat to them about, I don't think they're going to volunteer to come on themselves, but they might uh, know someone uh, who could. Um, just for those of you who are not familiar, what we're talking about really is what you would call transfer learning. Um, so transfer learning is basically this, this idea that, um, deep learning models can pick up can connect can take learning that they've learned in other tasks and then and then it, that's why it's called transfer learning and use it elsewhere so this zero shot pipeline we're talking about basically what it is it, it's a it's a deep learning text classification model that doesn't require any training data because it's trained on on just text on they just give it loads and loads and loads and loads of text and it learns about the features of text in a sort of generic way, if you like, um, and then it can then use that learning on on novel data sets. And we have done a bit of playing around with it in our team, and it works surprisingly well. It's it's quite remarkable, really, with absolutely no training whatsoever. Um, it can, yeah, it hits about 55, 60% accuracy across eight categories, which is remarkable, really. Uh, I mean, it's not brilliant, you know, in terms of production use, but considering it's had no training whatsoever, I think that's excellent. So that's basically what we're talking about, and I think that is a very good idea. Um, okay, great. Well, that's it. So that's all for the podcast. So I want to do the ending properly as well, which is something I haven't been doing. Um, so I want to thank Andreas for coming on. I want to thank you all for listening. And I want to also uh, do the thing that I should have been doing from the start, which is calling out our wonderful tireless editor working in the background, Tom Jemmett of the strategy unit. Um, and Tom's got his, a bit of extra work actually this time as well. So it's good that I'm thanking him this time because we had uh, we had a bit of a mess up in the middle of the podcast due to various people out the window and various things like that. Um, so if you listening at home can't detect that, that's all thanks to Tom's uh, brilliant uh, seamless editing. So I'm sure he will be able to make something beautiful out of this uh, proverbial pig's ear. Um, OK, thank you very much. And we will uh, see you all next time in about a month. Thank you. Cheers.